Welcome to episode six of Senior Care Insights, your podcast to help you navigate the world of senior care. My name is Dr. Deborah Moreland. I'm your host, and I'm also the owner of First Light Home Care of Greater Lansing and of Brighton. Today, we have a very interesting show coming for you. First of all, we have an extended interview with Dr. Michael Schaefer, who is the um, director of neuropsychology for the Sparrow Medical Group, and he's also the founder of the Greater Lansing Care Foundation. Our second interview will be with Lisa Regan, who is the owner of Honor Tree Consulting, and she will be discussing um, all of her, the types of services that you can get locally for senior care. And then finally, we have Jack Wires joining us again and discussing Family and Elder Care. He is the owner of Family and Elder Care of Mid Michigan. Stay tuned for an exciting show coming up. Welcome, Dr. Schaefer. How are you today? Good morning, Deb. How are you doing? I'm doing awesome. So, um, Thank you so much for being on our show today. Um, I know you have such a, a great amount of information to share with us about dementia. So first of all, yeah, tell us a little bit about me. what you do and how dementia is affecting the Lansing area at this point. Yeah, that's a really great question. You know, personally speaking, so I'm a neuropsychologist, somebody who looks at brain behavior relationships my specialty really is probably best thought of as a diagnostic endeavor, sort of looking at brain functioning, looking at cognitive testing, attempting to identify patterns and see if those patterns are consistent with various um, understandings of diseases, including neurodegenerative diseases. So pretty interesting stuff. I'm thinking about Alzheimer's disease, especially in the Lansing area, I think it's probably best to maybe take a step back for a second and think about Alzheimer's disease maybe more globally, or at least, let's say, throughout the United States. And if we just think about the prevalence rates for Alzheimer's disease in the United States, we think about that number being around six and a half million people. And so this is in itself an unbelievably um, daunting number to think about. And if you think about it as it relates to sort of mortality, the rates in the United States, Alzheimer's disease is around the sixth leading cause of death. But what's maybe more concerning than what exists now is what's looming for us. I think the data tells us that in 2050, uh, a third of this country, right, about we have 350 million people in this country, so a third of that population will be, be around 65 years of age. And we think of 65 years of age as being sort of this cutoff between early and, and late onset dementia processes, of, of which Alzheimer's disease is the most prevalent. So for us now, it's certainly alarming and concerning, and the efforts are there to identify treatments. But what's coming down the pipe is critical, right? It's critical levels. Um, and so if we think about that from that global perspective or that United States perspective, so nationwide, and then we think about it as paring it down and conceptualizing it in the state of Michigan, state of Michigan probably has somewhere in the neighborhood of 300,000 individuals who've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And it's probably really important for us to differentiate those two things. Um, and then the other thing is to think about is the number of individuals who are affected by this condition isn't just limited to patient populations, right? In fact, mm -hmm. most people have a caregiver, have somebody who's helping them. Uh, and so if we expand that conceptualization of the influence or the effect, the negative effect of Alzheimer's disease or dementias, we're probably talking about the United States, 15 million people. So pretty significant medical condition no medical treatments exactly yet uh, to, to cure the condition, but there's a lot of efforts. So when we think about this condition, again, just thinking about definitions for a second, if we think about, well, what does it mean to have dementia? So I frequently will hear this in my office or hear this in lectures that I do. And so the idea 
of dementia, really, just simply put, is to say that your functioning used to be here, so up high, okay, what you would call your pre-morbid level. It used to be average, used to be below average, used to be above average, wherever it was pre-morbidly. And that for some reason, that functional level, hallmark impairment would be maybe memory, but joined by deficits in executive functioning, uh, planning abilities, problem solving. So those aggregated deficits have, have become apparent either through objective neuropsych testing or some other facet. And so the question becomes, what caused the dementia? So if we think about dementia as an overarching concept, if we think about it as maybe an umbrella, for example, then we think underneath that umbrella, there are many, many types of dementia. Again, as I said earlier, the early, the most prevalent type of dementia, maybe 60 to 70% is Alzheimer's disease. But underneath that, uh, we would have Lewy body's disease, which is the second most common type of dementia, and it has its own features. And then Parkinson's disease would be the third type. And then underneath that, we would talk about vascular dementia, which is increasing in the United States markedly because of poor health. And then we have an alcohol-induced uh, dementia process. We have a frontal temporal lobe dementia process. Um, and so there are numerous types. And identifying the type is critical. Working with neurology to help identify that is, is important. But we get a better understanding of there's this, again, just kind of this umbrella idea, dementia being a decline in functioning. And then underneath it, there are types and causes up. And each of those causes we think has a little bit of a different neuropathology. There may be some shared pathologies there, but in general, we think there's different pathways. Okay. So how do you tell the difference between the different types of dementias? Or can you give us some like key features of each of those that you just discussed briefly? Yeah, yeah, great question. So a lot of times identifying and differentiating diagnoses comes down to really taking great histories. So looking at medical histories, family histories, um, and then neuro objective, neuro, um, objective examinations, cognitive examinations in conjunction with neuroimaging studies. More recently, thinking about like PET FDG scans, you know, historically MRIs looking for atrophy in the brain. So we try to take all that data and put it together and then we try to understand the functional impairments that families have described, because typically speaking, this is what appears to people first, right? My mom seems to have misplaced her keys a bunch lately. My mom just wrote a check a second time for the mortgage. My mom or my dad is having trouble with this. So those are those outward behaviors. And oftentimes we might conceptualize those as just a change in uh, an individual's ability to complete activities of daily living. So those are the things that we do every day. Um, and so for certain conditions, things become more prevalent. As an example, if one thinks about frontal temporal lobe dementia, of which there are three variants, and the most common variant is getting a lot of airplay right now because Bruce Willis has been diagnosed with this condition. It's called semantic dementia. And really what this does is attacks the left side of the brain. And when we looked at a picture of a brain, we would see greater levels of atrophy or um, uh, larger voids in the, the sulci on the left side versus the right side. And this is because our language centers are quite predominantly for most humans on that left side. Um, and so this condition, frontal temporal lobe dementia, affects people's personality and behaviors first. So that tends to be something you see in this condition. So again, a great clinical history can help you start to tease out, wow, it doesn't seem like it's memory problems. Rather, it seems like it's a change in attitude or behavior, maybe even some paranoia or neuropsychiatric symptoms of agitation, et cetera. If we think about Alzheimer's disease, we want to think about timelines. Again, if you think about statistics, just kind of uh, introductory statistics, we might think that from 65 to 75, maybe 3% of the population will have that condition. But as we age, so the number one risk factor for Alzheimer's disease or dementias in general is age. So as we age, the likelihood that we're going to develop changes, functional changes in our brain really increases. So we think about Alzheimer's disease, again, 65 to 75 being around 3%. 
then we are talking at 75 to 85, maybe that number increases a little bit. And then by the time we're in that 85, we're talking around 22%. And by the time we get up to 95, I think it's more than 33%, possibly upwards of 40% of all individuals will have that condition. And Alzheimer's disease has a fairly common or consistent behavioral pattern, which is to say, many, many people in the beginning will say, I really, really struggle finding words. I'll look at a cup as an example, and I'll say, you know, the thing that you drink from, it's black. I'm looking right at it, but I can't find the word cup. So dysnomia or difficulties identifying objects is something that people with Alzheimer's disease um, begin to describe in those early stages. It's also really interesting to think about Alzheimer's disease Again, maybe different than Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease patients, right? They oftentimes will exhibit tremor activities. Correct. If you think about, right, Parkinson's disease as a movement disorder, majority of the people with uh, Parkinson's disease will have some tremor, but not everyone. Maybe 30% of all people with Parkinson's don't even have tremors. So interestingly enough, Parkinson's disease, maybe in the neighborhood of 40 to 60% of all patients with Parkinson's before they ever exhibit what looks like Parkinson's, they will have depression and it will be pretty clinically uh, elevated. They will be clinically depressed. And so many people think about this as being a premorbid factor or a condition for Parkinson's disease, which makes sense to some extent because Parkinson's is a disruption of the substantia Niagara, which is a fancy way of saying there's a, there's a location in the middle of our brain and it produces dopamine and it goes up to the centers that help us with our movement and there seems to be a dysregulation for Parkinson's patients. So again, we know dopamine helps us with our mood. So that relationship doesn't surprise us too much. If we think about conditions like, let's say Lewy body's disease, well, Lewy body's disease, probably in the neighborhood of 20% of patients with Alzheimer's disease will have the same neuropathology as Lewy body's, which is a little different, again, neuropathologically speaking, than Alzheimer's disease. Um, which we think is associated with the amyloid beta clumping and the tau tangles. So we think about these two proteins as breaking down and clumping up and ultimately kind of dirtying up the brain. And 20% of patients with Alzheimer's, I think that's the right number, will have Lewy bodies concurrently. And Lewy bodies disease itself, specifically as a neurodegenerative process, is a little bit different than Alzheimer's disease. It tends to show up a little bit earlier and one of the hallmark features of Lewy body's disease is that the individuals will very, very frequently experience visual hallucinations, never auditory hallucinations, always visual hallucinations. And so this is a very unique feature of this condition. So if you're hearing somebody tell you about cognitive problems, if you know that they're a little younger, let's say they're 60, 59, 61, and they're telling you about visual hallucinations that they've never had before, they've never had a history of psychiatric disease, you could be concerned and it might be smart to focus in on, oh, this might be Lewy body's dementia. Lewy body's dementia also has some motor components that are consistent with Parkinson's disease or have some similarities. Again, they're not exactly the same, but they have some shared problems. So getting a great history, very important. Yeah, it sounds like it. And those are some things that people can look for as their parents or other loved ones age. And if those types of things start happening, they know to reach out to a neurologist or their family doctor first. I think so. You know, it's interesting. There's data out there that talks about uh, the utility of, say, like neuropsychological testing. And if you were to if you were to um, um, ask people who are internal medicine doctors or family physicians and say, what's the utility of neuropsychological testing? Have you, do you find that valuable? The, the number there is, you know, in the 90s, it's 90% of those referring physicians will say, yeah, this is extremely beneficial. And what's interesting is I think the rate of ultimately getting neuropsychological testing as people age is, is like 20%. So despite majority of the referring practitioners and providers saying this is something that's so valuable not very many people get it as a standard measure of health but like knowing our blood pressure levels and our cholesterol levels etc i think neuro knowing our cognitive levels and having baseline data from which we can then later compare things is a really great idea but again that's more preventative and 
you know, oftentimes insurance companies don't want to just pay for things just because you want to have a baseline level. Right, right. But it would be, it, is this something that people could request to have done? Yeah, absolutely. You can talk to your family physician and make a request to either be seen by, and again, I think, especially in the, let's say you're 65 and you haven't really had any problems, I think asking your family physician, do you think it'd be okay if I got neuropsychological testing to establish a baseline? I think that's a reasonable request. I doubt a primary care physician would say, sure, let's go to see a neurologist because a neurologist is there to look at structural changes in brains and to say, well, the complaints you're having are explained by, potentially explained by this. In the absence of having any complaints, I'm not sure what a neurologist would do. So I think the testing offers you even when you're healthy. And it's also kind of really important, uh, in my opinion, you know, to think about Alzheimer's disease or dementias as having also uh, pre-morbid conditions. So Alzheimer's disease actually has a condition that is called mild cognitive impairment. And we think of about it as being sort of a precursor to Alzheimer's disease. So it's a phase that exists before we're going to see demonstrated impairments in cognition. This is becoming more and more uh, interesting to people, especially when we think that the cause of Alzheimer's disease, again, there is not a consistent unified perception on what causes Alzheimer's disease quite yet, but there is a great deal of science to suggest there are relationships between the accumulations of amyloid beta and the tau proteins. Now there is a great deal of study to say, well, wait a minute, maybe those, those proteins, which again, you know, it's complicated. They get cleaved incorrectly. They get chopped incorrectly. They start to accumulate. Um, it's possible that that process is starting when we're 40 years old. We used to think that this was, you know, something that was reserved for later in life, but now we're getting mm -hmm. a sense, well, wait a minute, maybe these protein dysregulations are occurring much, much earlier in life, which is why some of the medicines aren't working because mm, we're okay. not starting them early enough. That's one of the, one of the suggestions. Okay. So, so you started the Greater Lansing Care Foundation. It's been about two years. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. My wife and I, my wife and I really have a passion. My wife does psychiatry. Uh, we just have a passion for helping people. I sat for many years on the Alzheimer's Association board. I have a real sense of community. And I thought to myself, uh, my wife and I thought, well, what about if we created an entity that helped families locally, people who are in our community, patients that we serve. And to us, a great deal of emphasis is placed on the individual with dementia. But what doesn't seem to exist both in our community and truly nationwide. And, and I would like to stop and say, it isn't that there's nothing that exists. It's just that it's not substantial in my opinion, but nothing seems to really exist to help caregivers or the family members. And so we talked right earlier, we say, Hey, if we think that there are six to 7 million people in this country with Alzheimer's disease, who these disease medications are aimed at, who treatment programs are aimed at, neurology focus aimed at, support groups aimed at, who's taking care of or helping, you know, the two people or three people that are helping each individual in most cases? And the answer is no one uh, or very limited resources. I shouldn't say no one. But in our community, again, there are entities, but our goal is to create a, a specific unified place for people to come to. And at least online is an example and that we can then provide them a roadmap for how as a caregiver to manage dementia, what to expect per staging, and how can they take care of themselves. So if we think just for a second about individuals who take care of individuals, in this country, somewhere in their neighborhood of like, I don't know, 30 to 40% of people taking care of people with Alzheimer's disease or dementia are also taking care of a child. And they're Very called no, it's, it's unbelievable, right? So here we have we have all their resources just stretched as far as we can. They're taking they're doing their very best, and so we know that individuals who are caregivers uh, very frequently do not manage their own health very well. More frequently than same aged individuals, they are depressed or they are anxious. 
oftentimes neglecting their own ability to exercise or eat well. And those are all things, by the way, that are controllable, modifiable factors that prevent getting dementia. So we know for a fact, not doing those things puts them in a camp that makes them more likely to get dementia in addition to the concept that their family member has dementia, which also puts them in a higher risk group because they have a genetic linking. So our goal is how can we help those individuals? And that's what we're aiming to do. Okay. And what what's, what uh, services or resources are provided by your foundation at this point? Yeah. So as we, as you said, we're, we're two years into it. And, and if you think about two years of a, a foundation, it's really like thinking about seconds almost. It's, it's so challenging mm-hmm. to get off the ground. And, and so what things have we accomplished? We've developed a social media presence. We've, ad- we've established online um, web pages. We have developed a lecture series. We have, we have goals of identifying specific treatment or interventions based on staging for people. And so that's the stuff we're working on right now. One of our goals, truly one of my one of my initial thoughts with regard to this foundation was something that result or resulted from an interaction I had with a patient in the emergency department. And so this gentleman who has Alzheimer's disease was at the grocery store, fell in the snow here in Michigan. Of course, it's cold frequently. He slipped on the ice, fell and had a subdural hematoma. And as I thought to myself, why in the world are we out at Myers, what are we doing out there? And his wife said, well, I have to get these groceries. So started me thinking like, well, wait a minute, what about if we developed a shift program, had a grant writing opportunity, people applied, and then for certain families, we then pay for the shift program so they don't leave the house. So the caregiver doesn't have to stress out. The care does, caregiver doesn't have to go through everything just to get those groceries or to get prescription pills or whatever, whatever it might be. So one of the things we're, we're working on is developing that program. We're also thinking about things in, in the winter, like just practically speaking, could we pay for snow removal for a caregiver who has a loved one with dementia who just can't get outside and do that themselves? Again, anything to increase and improve the caregiver's autonomy, reduce their stress levels, And right now, truly, we're working with some amazing mission partners to develop more programs. We are working to have things that are discounted for for the caregiver themselves, massages, chiropractic stuff, working with local groups all over the place to try to develop a network to help these caregivers just to make life a little easier. I think that would be really great. Just nobody should have, at the the end of the day, no one should have to, to manage Alzheimer's disease or dementia by themselves. And our goal is to help. Yes. And Monday you have a lecture with Dr. Yes. Lee. So that, that yes. sounds very exciting. And I think that it will be well attended. Yeah, I think it's going to be great. This is, again, it's our first endeavor into an educational series. So the foundation, just real quickly, was set up with three things in mind. Develop new programs, maybe 60%. Provide education to the community, maybe 30%. And then fund existing programs that are really amazing. Maybe that's 10%. So we're working on that. Again, second year feels like the first year, but it really feels like the first second. So we're, right. really, we're really working on getting there. But again, we've, we've really been so blessed to be partnered up with groups who just also see the benefit of helping people locally. Who just say, you know what? There's a value to us in that. We don't know where you're going. We don't know where the Greater Lansing Care Foundation will end, but we know that this is a path that's worthwhile. We know that it's important to be on this path. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing all of your knowledge with us on dementia. And uh, we'll be right back with Lisa Regan. The friendship, the 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 closeness that two people can have. My caretaker it just does everything I ask it to do. Motivates me to the extent that I know that I can live another day. She's my transportation. Where we shop, groceries, 
she fixed my hair for me. And she makes her lunch, she makes supper, she just ordinarily is a companion. And she walks the dog, which is wonderful. And so she's, she's a lovely companion. I love her. She's fantastic. And she's doing a good job. Time is valuable, especially when it comes to caring for a loved one. Instead of spending your day juggling caregiving tasks, you could actually spend quality time with your family, enjoying the memories, playing games, catching up on work, or simply relaxing and getting recharged. A client review stated, We used First Light Services to care for my mom for almost three years in her home. We were very lucky to find such loving and compassionate caregivers. They were knowledgeable about mom's issues and truly cared about her well-being as well as helping the family learn how to adapt to her changes. Our caregivers are professionally trained, background checked, must pass a drug test, and are compassionate. We offer flexible plans tailored to meet your family's needs, ensuring that you get time back in your day without compromising the quality of care. Don't let another day slip away being a caregiver. Make the call today and let First Light Home Care of Greater Lansing illuminate the pathway to exceptional home care and give you back the gift of time. Welcome, Lisa. Hi, Deb. How are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful. Thank well, you. Thank for inviting me to be on your podcast. Um, this is really an amazing adventure um, that you have taken on. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I like talking with people, but I think there are so many people in the community who do not know everything they need to know as, you know, they're aging or their, their parents are aging. So that's why mm -hmm. we started this podcast. So Lisa is the owner of Honor Tree um, so tell us a little bit about what Honor Tree Consulting does. Sure, certainly. Um, Honor Tree Elder Care Consulting is something that I started five years ago. Um, I want your listeners to reflect back to, actually to their own lives. And typically something in your life, whether it was inspirational or whether it was traumatic, has guided you to where you are now in your career path. And my chosen career path was um, inspired by my mom, my little mama. And um, my brothers and sister, myself, our, um, our spouses, we all found ourselves at a young age um, having to accompany mom on this uh, journey of Alzheimer's. So do I ever understand um, the deer in the headlight look that these families get when they speak to a doctor or, or a re rehab facility, she's going to discharge, she can't go home, things like that. Um, I've been through it. I totally understand it. I know that there's a gap and that gap needs more advocates like myself to help guide these families. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so give us a little bit of information about what you used to do before you started this agency. You know what? Um, I was in sales. Um, I was actually sales with Hershey Chocolate, which is um, a totally different. This was a total pivot um, in raising three kids. So um, I I learned, yes, I mean, a product is a product and you market and sales things in the same way. So it was kind of a natural and it was a natural fit because I had just gone through almost 12 years of being mom's advocate. And I kept telling my husband through that time, what is this teaching me? I mean, I hear of all these other moms, you go to these school events and everybody is into their career path and this and that. And I felt like I was getting left behind, but I truly wasn't. I was actually gobbling up the education of um, elder care. And um, I love it because I attach myself. They all have a story. They all are elders. They all have a beautiful story. And I love listening to it. And I want to give them a platform um, to share it with other people. And that could be within an assisted living rather than being in their home and being lonely. So um, I'm, I'm here for families uh, to help guide them through this process. Okay. 
Yeah, we we yeah. Um, have worked together a little bit in the past with the Alzheimer's Association or the Walk, mm-hmm. and also um, you used to work at it used to be called Robin Wood. It's something else now. Yes. But you were yes. in sales then too, so um, that's really- yes, I was. Yeah, but I have been. Um, gosh, since Mom had passed, um, I had taken the next wow, uh, twelve years, and I just dove mm-hmm. into this the elder care industry and worked at various uh, communities at various levels. Um, really got to understand it from the ground up, and then um, you know ventured off into the hospice realm, and so I gained a comprehensive knowledge of everything that's out there. So it's, it's, it just has served me very, very well. And um, I'm very dedicated to my clients and I treat everyone as if they were my mom. Mm-hmm. That's how we should be. We should treat everyone yeah. as we or yeah. our, our elders, you know, as if they, like I used to hang out with, you know, my old bus driver who was like a grandpa to me um, because my friends, yeah, it was my friend's grandpa, but I, I felt like it's always good to treat people as you want to be treated. And yeah. so the moon's home alone, I'm going somewhere. Why not take him? You know, just, yeah, just, yeah. Spending the time with these people is so interesting yeah. because, yeah. you know, you learn they bought their farm for a hundred dollars back in the day or whatever. Yes. It's so amazing how, how isn't it? Happen. It's yes. Yes. It's so, it's so interesting. And, you know, hence is the name Honor Tree. And if you look at my logo, um, there's two things with it. It looks like a brain, um, which the aging brain, but it's also that trunk of the tree. And who is the trunk of all of our family trees? It's our elders. And I just believe in um, providing guidance to families, but giving those those um the elderly, the honor that they deserve. So the dignity, the honor, you know, Deb, you do the same thing with your business. I mean, you, you do an incredible job. Oh, thank you. We try, we try, we want to, we want to <laughs> take care of people. And that's why I got into this. And that sounds like a lot of what you yeah. want to do as well. So, yes. so what yes. sets honor tree apart from other advisors? I mean, there you are know, men, um, probably, but yeah. There's, you know, there, there are a group of advisors out there. Uh, I, I would have to say um, that if someone was thinking of getting on Google and starting, because that's what you do, don't you? You go home, it's at middle of the night, you can't sleep because you're like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You get on Google. And um, some of these um, national name um, advising companies, um, they, they have a very tricky way of capturing your contact information. And um, once they do that, they automatically send it to an advisor. This advisor is not even in your area. This advisor is not aware of the communities. I have to say a local advisor, they know our com- they know the communities inside and out. They know if that leadership team has been in place for a while. They know what's going on uh, to know if it's a correct fit or not. And so that's that's hard. It's hard because what happens is is that once you get linked into that and it goes out to all these communities, it locks us local advisors out of being able to assist the family. And that's and that's a shame. A lot of families get very upset um, as they start receiving all these phone calls. So looking for a local advisor and how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, you might have to Google, um, but um, a lot of times you could speak to your PCP, your primary care doctor, um, a neurologist, um, sometimes talking to friends, reaching out to your church, Um, You know, we really try to be out there and get the name out there. You know, I mean, there are various, various uh, companies within the area. Everyone's going to do you a great job. Um, And, you know, I just, I, I offer myself my listening ear, my knowledge. I've been there. I feel it. I know what you're doing and um, work really, really hard to get you a solution. 
Yeah, I know. I, I believe the local advisors are way above the the normal, you know, national names that are out there. The people that they talk to don't have a clue about our community. They, they don't, don't know who's who's got beds available, who's um, doing a good job, who's understaffed. All of that stuff comes into play. And at one point, you know, there might be an assisted living that's doing very well, but all of a sudden, yeah. management exactly. might change, something might yep. change, but, yep. you know, really, it's just, yeah. they're paying to get the phone calls. Mm -hmm. And they you know, and you're so, you're so right, Deb. We have had such a change throughout COVID, haven't we? We've had a COVID with everything. I mean, even going to the restaurant and dining since then, coming out of COVID or if that's what you want to call it. But um, it is, it's, it's, you know, communities, they are trying hard, the ones that are there. Um, a lot of them are running short staff. Um, I pride myself in staying um, current and up to date in what's happening within these communities. Um, I take it very personal when I'm giving a family an option and I feel responsible for their loved ones. So um, I usually kind of hang around for about a month after they've moved, just checking on them, checking on the family and just making sure everything's going okay. Mm -hmm. You also refer to home care companies as well. So I certainly do. I have this absolutely wonderful, yes. Yes, I do. I, I do. Um, you know, First Light Home Care, you have helped me with some of my clients that have had difficult issues. And um, I have to say, you know, you 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 do what you say, Deb. And that's what I that's what I look for. Mm -hmm. Right. So a person doesn't necessarily need to be wanting to go to an assisted living or mm -hmm. They can, they might be looking for home care or any other options and you can help them with that. So that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. You know, um, there's many a times where I will get a referral from a social worker and, you know, they're not, they're not discovering because there's pieces, I call it a puzzle and there's pieces to this puzzle. And that's the, what I love. I love getting all this information and to put the puzzle together because, you know, not only do you need to know, you know, your loved ones, likes, dislikes, what healthcare support they need. Um, uh, you know, are they social? Do they like to be by themselves? You know, things like that. The communities, every community offers something different. Or is it best that they stay at home? And then that's where we talk about having home care brought in. But um, there's just, there is so much. I have a lot of people and they'll go, well, my neighbor told me we should go to an AFC. AFCs are absolutely beautiful, but they're beautiful for a certain time frame. Um, you know, you got to know that most of them, um, you know, there's not a secure door. There's not. You know, the two person assist is something that they can't do, you know, things like that, that um, I help with so that families aren't making the the wrong reason, I guess I want to say, I hate to say it wrong, but sometimes, you know, they have to move somewhere and move somewhere again. So let's not cut. Let's cut that out. Let's let's make one move the right move. Right. Then that's a good point. Definitely. Uh, so what are the benefits to our listeners of using an you know, advisor? The yeah, the, the benefits of reaching out to an advisor. You know, let me ask um, everyone this. You know, may, some of you could have been recently told by your physician or you recognize the fact by coming into your parents' home. Uh, um, and you're almost like a deer in a headlight. It's like, well, what do I do? What do I do? You become paralyzed with, I don't know who to reach out to. What do you just typically do? You reach out to Google. Um, you'll talk to the barbershop. You'll talk to when you get your donuts. You'll talk, you know, you'll just randomly start talking to people. And um, the one thing about an advisor is it's no cost to you. And that's across the board. It's no cost to families and um, their elderly senior. Um, we are here. We're here. All of us have a deep knowledge. Let us 
let us help guide you through it. You know, we present options. You're not you're not turning the decision over to us. We present options, but we present options. Um, I know I do. I take the care of not overwhelming my client because typically when they call, they are totally overwhelmed. They don't know which way to go first. And I back them up. And I say, okay, let's 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 just go through this one step at a time. First of all, you know, just please tell me tell me about your mom. Just tell me about her. And then they kind of and it gets them, you know. And does she like this? Does she like? We kind of just start getting them, and then we go a little deeper, a little deeper, a little deeper. But um, you know, the benefit of having somebody to talk to. And to be able to explain to you some of this terminology that has been thrown at you that you have no idea. I mean, mm. even in the fact of, Deb, you know, assisted living, independent living, you know, memory care, all these different styles, AFC, group homes, you know, you go, what is this all about? What does it mean? Well, each one has a purpose and each one can only take you to a certain level of support. So, you know, um, for you to figure it out, you're going to have to go through a lot of discovery where, um, you know, like myself, I can, I can get you on the right track uh, quicker. All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining our show today. Uh, I'm sure uh, some people didn't realize that having an advisor is is at no cost to them and it's it's worth even just talking to someone and finding out what options are available so thank you so much for joining us and next oh, we absolutely have... thank Go you ahead. so much Deb. yeah you're welcome next we're going to have dr michael schaefer on the show and he is the founder of the greater lansing care foundation The friendship, the, the, the closeness that two people can have. My caretaker it just does everything I ask it to do. Motivates me to the extent that I know that I can live another day. She's my transportation. When we shop, groceries, she fix my hair for me. And she makes her lunch, she makes supper, she just ordinarily is a companion. And she walks the dog, which is wonderful. And so she's, she's a lovely companion. I love her. She's fantastic. And she's doing a good job. Time is valuable, especially when it comes to caring for a loved one. Instead of spending your day juggling caregiving tasks, you could actually spend quality time with your family, enjoying the memories, playing games, catching up on work, or simply relaxing and getting recharged. A client review stated, we used First Light Services to care for my mom for almost three years in her home. We were very lucky to find such loving and compassionate caregivers. They were knowledgeable about mom's issues and truly cared about her well-being as well as helping the family learn how to adapt to her changes. Our caregivers are professionally trained, background checked, must pass a drug test, and are compassionate. We offer flexible plans tailored to meet your family's needs, ensuring that you get time back in your day without compromising the quality of care. Don't let another day slip away being a caregiver. Make the call today and let First Light Home Care of Greater Lansing illuminate the pathway to exceptional home care and give you back the gift of time. Good afternoon. Welcome, Jack. How are you doing, Deb? Doing Good great. To Good to see you. Yeah, great to see you again. All right. We have Howard J. Wires, a.k.a. Jack from the Family and Elder Law in Michigan. And he's gonna be speaking to us today about powers of attorney. So after nearly 25 years of it being in the employee benefit um, industry, Jack decided to go back to school to pursue his dream of becoming an attorney. Coincidentally, he had the privilege of being a primary caregiver for his mother as well, who struggled with Alzheimer's disease. All of these experiences occurred at or around the same time to inspire him to pursue a career 
in the area of estate planning and elder law to help families plan for and endure in times of need. So could you tell us about a significant moment and or experience that inspired your strong commitment to helping families dealing with various illnesses? Yeah, sure can, Deb. Um, so the it, it's kind of a real kind of confluence of things that happened all at once, but I decided to go back to law school at a, a very old age. Um, and when I did that, uh, you have to take a law school entrance exam. So I had talked to some people that I knew were practicing law and they had visions of me entering practice with them in the gaming law area. So it was very different than what I'm doing today. So you take a test called the LSAT, which is the law school entrance exam. The day after I took that exam, my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So um, I was still gonna go down the, the original path, but as, as you mentioned before, Deb, I was one of her primary caregivers. Um, and as we went through that process, uh, you know, I would take mom out, try to keep her engaged as much as I could. And one of the things I did was take her to a local uh, memory care facility because they did gardening there and it was somewhere I could take her where she could garden and be safe that we didn't have to worry about her wandering off. And while I was there, um, I just watched, you know, just kind of observ observed the other folks that were at the nursing home. And there were folks that were there all alone and their family never visited them. Mm -hmm. there, there were folks where your whole, you heard the families, you know, just fretting about how they were going to pay for care and continue to pay for care. And then the worst ones where you'd see, hear the people sitting around waiting for, wondering if, if grandma was gonna die in time that they'd still get some money. So, you know, you saw the really good and the really bad there. And that experience really inspired me to give up the gaming law piece and, and, and become an elder law attorney. So that's really what got me here. And that's what kind of fuels my passion on a daily basis. Okay. Well, today we're going to talk about the importance of powers of attorney. Yeah. And uh, so can you explain what are powers of attorney? So powers of attorney can cover a pretty broad area, but we always kind of talk about, refer to it as above ground planning. So it's w the planning that you do if you're above ground, so you're still alive, but you're not well. So what's going to, what would happen if you became incapacitated? Who could make various decisions for you and act on your behalf. Um, so there are really a couple areas of concern that we, we really want to address. And if you don't address it yourself, the court system in our state, in Michigan and most states, has a resolution too. But most people don't want the state making decisions for them and, and creating the rules for which their care would be provided and how their money might be spent to provide that care. So there are really two primary documents that we use. One's called a patient advocate designation. Some other, some people call it a healthcare power of attorney or a medical power of attorney or a healthcare proxy. And it's a document where you name the person who can make your healthcare decisions for you if you can't. The other document we use, we refer to it as a durable power of attorney. And that is the document that allows people to make financial and legal decisions for you uh, when you can't make them for yourself. Okay. So what powers of attorney are needed? Are both of these needed and why are they needed? Well, so again, as I said, the, the reason that they're different is because they're different in the law. So in Michigan, you may have heard of legal, legal proceedings called guardianship and conservatorship. A guardianship is if, if somebody hasn't executed powers of attorney, um, and they can no longer make decisions regarding their care, custody, medical, and mental health treatment, someone has to go to the court and petition to become their guardian. Oftentimes the state does this, sometimes family members. Um, a patient advocate designation in Michigan, that's, that's how it's encoded in the law, uh, is a document that allows you to appoint a patient advocate and their successors if they can't act because sometimes your, your agent may not be able to act. So we try to build some depth into that document and to create rules as it relates to your care, custody, medical and mental health treatment to give them direction. Some people have heard the term advanced directives or, or medical directives. So if there's a grant of legal authority that gives someone the authority to make those decisions for you. 
And then you can provide direction or instructions in that document so they know how you want to be cared for. So in short, as it relates to your health care, you get to a point, you get to choose the people who will act for you rather than the court making that decision. And you get to decide the rules they play by, play by rather than a judge making those decisions for you. So that relates to the healthcare piece and it's a separate document. And the, the other document, as I said before, is a durable power of attorney. And that's, would you name someone to act to make legal and financial decisions for you if you're incapacitated? So who pays the bills? Um, so, and it, these can be two different people. You can have a patient advocate that's different from your power of attorney. And oftentimes people like those kind of checks and balances, or they want to, you know, split up the duties because sometimes these aren't the, the most fun jobs and you have other people questioning your, the decisions you're making and things like that. But we try to do the same thing in that document as we provide direction as to how we want our money spent. Um, and, you know, together those things are you have the person who can arrange for your care and then the other person who arranges for payment of your care and make sure all your other bills get paid. Okay. So who, who basically needs a power of attorney? Well, interestingly, and this is one that people forget, and it doesn't necessarily relate to seniors, is really everyone over the age of 18 should have powers of attorney. And there's a couple different scenarios that you might think of, but if you send a child off to college, they get in a car wreck and they're injured, you as your parent, once they're 18, you as their, they're an adult, you as their parent no longer have legal authority to make decisions for them as it relates to their health care. So we always say everybody who's reached the age of 18 should have at least a patient advocate designation, if not a financial power of attorney. Um, so really everybody needs them. So there's the kind of that piece is every adult if they want to make the decision as to who's going to make those decisions for them should have powers of attorney. Um, and the other thing is kind of a public, you know, kind of a public duty to do these things, because if you don't do it, you're going to tie up the court system. Um, and, uh, uh, the, you know, a judge and in, in the court's resources, when you could have taken action yourself um, to make these decisions and not put the burden on the court system to do so. Right. And the court isn't necessarily going to make the decisions that you want. That's very, that's very true. So one of the things that we've seen it recently, and it, it is a little bit troubling, but I was just actually sending out an email here earlier to a gentleman who he's concerned that his stepmother isn't caring for his dad the way that he would like to see his dad be treated. So, and we don't know if she has power of attorney, um, but he asked he should asked if he should go to court and apply for guardianship or conservatorship. And I said, the risk that you run there is stepmom as wife will have statutory priority to act as dad's guardian and conservator. But son, if, if son can show that she's maybe not acting in his best interest, the judge may not pick the son automatically to be guardian and conservator because oftentimes judges who get elected don't want to make that call. And the easy call for them to make is to appoint a public administrator. And that's when you see, and I mean, some of you may see the, seen the show, I Really Care on Netflix, where you see public, public people, public administrators or private people acting as professional guardians and conservators um, acting in those roles. So you've got somebody who's in charge of your health care and your money who you don't even know. Okay. So it's a bit risky and most people don't it want to. It sounds like it. <laughs> it sounds very risky. Yeah. So in fact, recently there was a, a court of appeals case here in Michigan where the court of appeals admonished a probate judge because he was doing this kind of, it, it, it became his, his standard of practice is when people came in, he would just point, appoint public guardians rather than appoint family members, even when the family members wanted to be the guardian. So it's okay. just doing the powers of attorney is just a way to, for you to take control and for you to make the decisions rather than you know, leaving that up to the state or the court. What specific decisions can all be made in a power of attorney in terms of health care? So we have what we call basic documents. And so a basic, for example, a basic, basic patient advocate designation. In my case, I, Jack Wires, appoint my wife, Becky Wires, to make health care decisions when two doctors have certified that I'm no longer able to participate in my own health care decisions. If Becky can't do it, my buddy Mike is next. If Mike can't do it, my sister's next. 
So we build that kind of flexibility into the document. So that's the first decision you make. And we think you ought to make that, you know, with some forethought, you want people to be able to carry out your wishes. In that basic document, there's generally a section that gives you one of three choices as it relates to end of life. So the first choice would be, if I'm in a coma or irreversible vegetative state with no hope of recovery, if life-sustaining treatment would only artificially delay my death or the burdens of treatment, in my patient advocate's opinion, outweigh the benefits of treatment, please cease all life-sustaining treatment and let me die naturally while relieving me of pain and keeping me comfortable. So that would be choice one. There's a second choice that just says, if I, only if I'm in a coma or irreversible vegetative state, stop life-sustaining treatment. And then the third choice is keep me alive no matter what. So that would be in a basic document. In an enhanced document, we, were, we would put directions as to different things. You want family there to pray with you, um, what kind of music you wanna have played while you're at the hospital. Do you wanna be taken outside before you pass away? All those sorts of things. We can put direction as it relates to organ donation, uh, donating your body to science, um, you know, how you wanna be remembered. If you're in a long-term care situation, we create another document called a personal care plan. And that's just how you want to be treated on a day-to-day -day basis. Mine says, give me two, two cups of black coffee before 10 a.m. This is the kind of music I like. This is the kind of music I really don't like. Um, I'm spiritual, so, you know, please expose me to spiritual, spiritual situations when you can. I want to be taken outside a couple times a day unless it's a blizzard or rains all day like it did here today. Um, and... Uh, you know, don't feed me liver because my grandpa used to make me eat it all day and don't feed me shrimp because it'll kill me. So we create, we can be that detailed and, you know, in your job, you know, so oftentimes you've got people you're caring for that can't really express how they want to be cared for. And if we can provide an instruction manual, it makes everybody's job easier, creates peace of mind and hopefully prevents family fights when people start questioning at, as, you know, the, the patient advocate on how, why they're providing treatment the way they are. Okay. So that's something we do in the healthcare. The, the financial power is a little bit less, you know, flexible. There's kind of more legalese in that document. But some of the things we do there is we integrate the financial power of attorney with the rest of an estate plan um, so that we're, we're coordinating the, the actions of the patient advocate with the financial power of attorney to make sure care is paid for appropriately. If you're a business owner, um, who can run your business? Because that may not be the family member that you choose as your your financial power of attorney. Um, and uh, we put all the powers that would be needed in that document to uh, and direction as to how we might protect the assets if we were in a very long-term situation that might bankrupt the family where we could try to qualify them for Medicaid and your benefits if needed. So how would someone go about getting um, powers of attorney completed? Well, there, so there's a, there's a lot of you know ways you can do it. You can go online and find them. Um, I don't necessarily recommend that because maybe I'm being a little selfish in that re that regard. But I think there's some counseling that goes into that to the the process. So in some thought, you know, oftentimes we see people just name their kids the oldest to youngest, and then they end up with the wrong agent. They maybe haven't thought through the decision making process. So you know the easy answer there is come see a lawyer, come see an estate planning or elder law attorney, Hope preferably somebody that does elder law and have them, you know, just have these discussions about what you want to have happen, what you don't want to have happen and who the right people are to make those decisions for you. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us today on Senior Care Insights. Uh, your information was very valuable. I'm sure a lot of people don't realize everything that can be done using a power of attorney. And hopefully it saves some people some peace of mind and they'll get in touch with you if they have any questions at all. All right. Thanks, Deb. Appreciate you having me here. Yeah. Thank you for joining us.